Okay. Time to get started. Good evening and welcome to the Kansas City Public Library. I'm Henry Fortunato, Director of Public Affairs. Thank you for joining us um, in the second iteration of this month's Stealth Series. Stealth Series, it's, it's not really been announced publicly, but what it really is is not so great moments in French military history. <laughs> Tonight's program marking the 75th anniversary of the defeat of France by Nazi Germany, as well as the one we did two weeks ago, commemorating the 200th anniversary of Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, suggests that we got some possibilities here. Both of these programs attracted over 250 people. <laughs> I got to work on that. Um, I will say that both of these programs could not have been possible without our excellent and extraordinary partners at the Department of Military History, at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, over the, over the nine years that I've been Director of Public Affairs at the library, we've entered into and developed a lot of partnerships, but I, I cannot think of one that has been more resoundingly wonderful than with the folks at, at Fort Leavenworth. And that's why, you know, um, continuing with our, our stealth series, um, I want to suggest to you, uh, look at that calendar. Um, in November, we can examine the 62nd anniversary of the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, when the French were defeated by the Vietnamese communists. <laughs> Actually, I'm kidding. I won't be here in November. <laughs> but I am here tonight, um, a little more than 75 years to the day when the world turned upside down. In just six weeks, the Wehrmacht had shattered the French army, the Third Republic collapsed, a strange little quasi-fascist rump state called Vichy France arose, and outside of the successful evacuation from Dunkirk, things looked pretty grim. In uh, the landmark study, To Lose a Battle, France 1940, first published in 1969, British historian Alistair Horne posed these questions. Who and what were responsible for France's catastrophe in 1940? Could the game have been played differently? And at what point did the disaster become irredeemable? These questions still resonate, and tonight, in what I know will be an excellent talk, Dr. Mark T. Gurgis is going to address them and more. Mark is an associate professor in the Department of Military History at the Command General Staff College. He earned a bachelor's in history and military studies from Norwich University in Northfield, Vermont, plus an MA and a PhD from Florida State University in Tallahassee. His doctoral dissertation was on the command and control of the British cavalry under the Duke of Wellington during the Peninsular War of 1808 to 1814. Mark is also a 20-year veteran of the U.S. Army with service in armor units in Europe, the Middle East, and the United States. In addition to his work at Fort Leavenworth, Mark has also taught history at the United States Military Academy at West Point. Tonight's talk is Mark's second appearance at the library. In 2011, he gave the lecture on Napoleon that was part of our Great Commander series. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mark Gurgis. Thanks, Henry. Thank you. I didn't realize it was part of a stealth series here on the uh, defeats of France because um, Henry was very kind, kind of jumping around a little bit on my, uh, my particular biography because I am much more comfortable talking about the Duke of Wellington, uh, Napoleon, um, and uh, the British Army 
uh, fighting in Portugal and Spain. That's really my research area. And so you could probably ask why did a nice Napoleonic guy like I get sucked into the 20th century. And uh, part of it is um, a quote from Alistair Horne, the book that uh, uh, Henry mentioned. Where Alistair Horne talks about the battle of France, in particular Sedan, he says, it was the crisis for France, for Western civilization, and it would come to be regarded as one of the crucial moments of the 20th century. And I would imagine that most people here tonight probably haven't thought about this as the crucial moment of the 20th century, but let me go back a little bit of why I particularly find myself fascinated about this campaign and really have spent the last 30 years researching and looking into this campaign. And I, uh, I'm a, a child of the 60s, uh, coming to age in the 70s, and I was raised on things like the BBC series The World of War, um, war movies, Patton, all these other ones that kind of painted this tactical superiority of the Germans, that you just knew that they were so unbelievably skilled at the tactical level uh, that any sort of mechanized warfare was really a predetermined uh, outcome. Um, and then I'm commissioned as an armor officer, and um, I will spend uh, my first tour in Germany as a tank platoon leader um, in the 3rd Armored Division, the northern portion of the Central Army Group. Uh, on our left flank was a German Corps. We had a partnership battalion with the Panzer Grenadier, um, uh, or partnership battalion was the Panzer Grenadier Battalion. We called our tanks Panzers. And the U.S. Army at that time was on a renaissance of its, uh, of its doctrine and looking at this, this idea called air land battle. And to do this, they had gone back to German philosophers or Prussian philosophers like Karl von Clausewitz, talking about using in our own doctrine, in our professional journals, things like Schwerpunkt, uh, the, uh, the main effort, uh, the finger, your spritz and uh, fuga, the, the, the finger touching uh, to know the pulse of the, uh, the enemy. Um, and so all these terms are kind of in there. And then I read a book. Um, and it was Alistair Horns to lose a battle. And um, we kind of in Germany at that time period were really all in about how good the Germans were and their superiority um, over the French and over, uh, over the Russians. And then when you read Alistair Horn's book, Alistair Horn paints a different picture. He talks about really all these opportunities for the French just slipping away, how these opportunities are there. And the French are just acting too slowly. They're just missing the opportunity. They don't notice it at the time. Um, and it really piqued my interest, and it was one of these things that I kept looking on. And, and then in the 1990s, I went to West Point, and my boss uh, there was a, a Colonel Robert Doty, who was the head of the department. He had written a book to lose uh, to uh, uh, the breaking point about the fall of Sedan. And it focuses just on the 19th Panzer Corps breaking through at the Battle of Sedan. And interestingly enough, um, there's really no tanks there. This is just German infantry versus French infantry and it's a, a straight up fight. And it really, again, puts that blitzkrieg mythology that we've kind of crooned to just assume or to uh, assume is correct uh, to question. And then of course, by the early 2000s, Karl Heinz Frieser, who's a historian with the, the Bundeswehr, the German army, um, is gonna publish a book first in German, translated into English um, called Blitzkrieg Legend, which he addresses specifically the myth of the Blitzkrieg that has grown up in, in the fall of France, uh, 1940. Um, I also had the opportunity when I was first in the Department of Military History to do a staff ride. Uh, it's what the Army uh, calls our visits to battlefields, but it's more than just a visit. We actually do preparation beforehand. The students have to do preparation, and then they go out to the actual piece of ground and study what happened, why do commanders make certain decisions. And so in 2002, I was able to go to Sedan and actually study with some U.S. Army officers and French officers who were going to the French version of the Command General Staff College and walk this ground and look at the ground and try to figure out what had gone on. So, see, it's been pretty much a 30-year piece of why this campaign has, has fascinated me so much. And there's a number of reasons about uh, mythology about the Allied collapse. Uh, everything from the German tanks were just so much superior uh, to the French. Uh, they had more tanks. Uh, the fifth column, this, this shadowy group of people who are cutting telegraph lines, uh, telephone lines, um, sowing destruction and, and disorder in the French rear area. The bridges over the Meuse River not being blown. Um, the impenetrable, this idea that the Ardennes forest is impenetrable. No one could go there. The French are absolutely surprised uh, by that. Uh, and then also this defensive mentality of the Maginot Line. 
Hopefully, as we go through the talk tonight, I'll hit address all these uh, particular ones. If I don't address them directly, we can talk about them as we go uh, into the questions and answers. I do want to point out in the photos real quick just a couple of things. Notice the Victory Parade in Paris. This is uh, late June 1940, the Victory Parade going by the Arc de Triomphe on the Champs-Élysées. Notice the mechanization of the German army. <laughs> About 80% of the German army is going to be horse-drawn and foot-powered throughout the entire Second World War. Uh, and we tend to think about the Germans as being this, this mechanized juggernaut and being so good um, on, on just how in automobiles. Um, the first Audubon uh, is a section from Hanover to Basel. Uh, Basel. Uh, oh, it started in 1935. It doesn't get finished till 1967. German car ownership in 1940 is 1.5% of the population. France at that time has 5% of the population, and the United States, with our love of automobiles, is a 20% uh, population. So this mythology, and much more of the German army, is horse-drawn like this. I also have two generals that we'll talk a lot about tonight. One is Heinz Guderian, um, Armor Corps commander of the 19th Panzer Corps. Um, I want you to notice both him and Erwin Rommel, who's a major general at that time, commanding the 7th Panzer Division, notice what's around their neck. They have binoculars, okay? As a general officer, you really don't need binoculars unless you are up front with the uh, leading elements trying to make decisions, trying to point it. And that's part of the secret of this German success is the leading from the front uh, that the German officers are going to do. The man in the middle, the little sad um, downcast, is 68-year-old uh, um, the uh, Gamelin, uh, who's the French commander-in-chief. Notice he does not have binoculars around his neck. <laughs> His headquarters at Vincennes on the, outskirts, on the uh, eastern outskirts of Paris does not have radios. He doesn't want radios there. He wants tele uh, telephone lines coming in. Every hour on the hour, a motorcycle courier leaves with dispatches for the front. And part of this is just showing the differences of the mentality of the two sides as we go into, uh, um, into this. But let me go back a little bit and talk about how we got here. And I really need to start a little bit with the France in the 1920s and 30s. Um, July 14th, 1919, um, Bastille Day is the day of the Great Victory Parade. It lasts for about 12 hours. The first contingents come by of all the Allied armies who fought with France. Um, and then the French army for about six hours will pass um, going through all the different types of units. And you would think that would be a celebration, uh, a, a thing of we've won. And really the, the mood of this victory parade is not so much that we won as we survived. We got through it somehow. And this is the mood that's going to really strike France as it goes throughout the, uh, the 1920s and 30s. It's not a celebration that we've defeated our French or our German uh, opponent. It's that we survived. And the effort that France has to do um, to do this is, is immense. Um, we tend to, being in the English-speaking world, kind of think a lot about the British in World War I, if you're following along all the World War I um, uh, commemorations for the centennial, it's so much on the British contributions. But 75% of the front line is held by French troops, and that's in 1918 after the U.S. Army comes in and takes 100 miles out of the, uh, uh, out of the front. Um, so the vast majority, and, and the French have got a very macabre way of, of describing things. Um, you see that they had almost a half a million killed, um, about 1.5 million wounded. Um, every year at, at Saint-Cyr, their, their military academy, they have a plaque that'll say the class year and they'll have the list of names of everyone who died defending France. So they'll have, say, the class of uh, 1916 and they'll have all the names of these officers who died defending France. The only year that, that doesn't have that is the class of 1914. And all the class of 1914's uh, plaque says is the class of 1914. 100% of the graduates of San Sierra that year will die in the next four years. Of the military age males between 18 and 27 uh, years old, 27% are going to die uh, in the First World War. And this means a huge port, part for uh, France, not only just the destruction um, uh, for France, it also means that 20 years later that they're going to have what they call the hollow years. In 1914, when they call up the reserves, uh, the mobilization, they have about 1.2 million Frenchmen 
able uh, to go to war. 1940, that number is at 600,000, half of 1914, because of the Holly years, the young men who die during the Great War, who don't have children, don't get married, um, and so are never born. Um, the other aspect is this lesson to Verdun. Ten-month battle, the Germans initiate this, and it's meant to be a meat grinder, to absolutely bleed the French army white by using massive amounts of artillery fire. Um, they, they pick Verdun because it's symbolic uh, to the French nation, and it is gonna become this catastrophic uh, fight uh, for 10 months. And the Germans kind of forget why they're fighting there and using the artillery fire, and they will get drawn in. Um, but for the French army, every single infantry regiment in the French army will rotate through Verdun. Um, and one of the lessons of this is just the, the absolute destructive power of modern firepower. You can't send brave young men like you could in 1870 or back in the Napoleonic era to cross the beaten ground. You have to rely on firepower to do that, and then infantry will occupy. The other aspect, there's two forts uh, at the Verdun area, Fort Dumont and Vaux, which are gonna hold out against the Germans with very, very few defenders uh, against, uh, at one point, division level uh, attacks. And the other lesson is that these prepared de defenses have a huge uh, benefit that you don't have to uh, sacrifice your lives. What it means is you come out of World War I is that the French and Germans start to diverge in their doctrine of what just happened. Um, in the latter part of uh, March and April of 1918, the Germans will go on the offensive. They're gonna go on the offensive using what they call infiltration tactics. It's not based on armored vehicles. It's by initiative and small unit actions. And they're going to, for the first time in the war, restore mobility to the battlefield, but they can't sustain it because of the losses they're gonna take. After the war, the German army is reduced down to 100,000 men, basically a big police force. And during that time period, 1920, 1921, they're gonna study what just happened. And Hans von Secht, who's gonna be head of the, uh, the Reichswehr, interestingly enough, sets up 57 committees. And he doesn't say, what did we learn in the war? He says, what just happened? What did we do about it? What happened that we did not expect? And what do you think that means for the future? And so these 57 committees look at this. And then in 1921 and 1922, they published new doctrine based on those lessons they learned from the war. What this, and I, and I bring this out because mechanization has nothing to do with the way the Germans wanna fight this idea that we call blitzkrieg, which of course is not a German word. It's coined by a British uh, correspondent. The Germans would have fought this way whether they had wheeled vehicles, whether they had tanks, or if they were on foot. Um, it has nothing to do with the, the, the means of moving. It had everything to do with what you want to do with the enemy. The French take a different lesson to, uh, from it. This idea of the firepower is you have to have massive amounts of artillery, and a senior commander has to be able to sit back and see where the real problem is gonna be, and then he can mass the artillery to fire against that position. What that means is the commander can't be too far forward. He has to be back, have good communications, he has to be able to see, and then move those assets around to be able to, uh, to, to strike them. And so the French doctrine starts to be what they call the methodical battle. This idea that you use massive amounts of firepower, don't send your young men there, and then occupy it with tanks and infantry, consolidate, and then you move forward again and again. The last aspect is just the Third Republic itself, and we don't have time tonight to go into the problems with the left and the right in the Third Republic. Um, one of the issues, though, is in the, 20, or the last 10 years, 1930, 1940, there's 19 different prime ministers, 19 different changes of government. Despite that, despite uh, the, the, the fights between the left and the right in France, France still spends a huge amount of effort and a huge amount of time modernizing their army, preparing for the next war with Germany, because they know they're right next door. Um, so let's talk about uh, World War I. And uh, the German plan in World War I is what's known as the Schlieffen Plan, a huge hook uh, through Belgium, uh, aimed towards Paris, designed to destroy the French army in one big throw. It doesn't work uh, in the summer of 1914, and you're gonna settle down into a front line that basically for about four years stays roughly where that green line is. Why is this important as you start to look at um, the French uh, planning in the 1920s and 1930s? And you should notice one thing on there I have is the Maginot Line that has now been built. Maginot Line's been built directly between 
the uh, avenue of approach between the French and the Germans. Maginot Line is not meant to sit behind and wait for the Germans to attack you. It's meant to make the Germans go somewhere else, which they do, which means the Maginot Line works exactly the way it's supposed to work. The French know this, the Germans know this. But it means you have to do certain other things, and we'll talk about that in a second. But if you look at that yellow triangle, that yellow triangle from the coast down to about Strasbourg back to Paris, has a huge percentage of the French heavy industry. You want airplanes, you want tanks, you want heavy artillery, you want munitions, you can't allow a war on your own frontier again. Which means as wartime planning goes on in the 1920s and particularly in the 1930s, the idea is you have to move forward as much as po possible into Belgium and hold the Germans out of there so you can produce all those munitions you need uh, to fight. That's just showing where the front line uh, was in World War I and why the French can't allow that to happen again. So by the spring of 1940, and remember we have, um, the war starts the 1st of September when the Germans invade Poland. Three days later, uh, Great Britain and uh, France declare war on Germany. Poland falls after 28 days. The entire world is shocked uh, of how good the German army is, uh, except for the German army. And if you look at the German army after action reviews, they talk about their infantry is not as good as the Kaiser's infantry of 1914. They have problems at every level, from squad level with the soldiers with machine guns, all the way up to divisions. They have entire divisions that the structure just doesn't work. Um, soldiers don't take initiative. They are afraid of shooting their weapons because the enemy will then shoot back. Um, <laughs> and that is a quote. Um, so there's all these issues um, that the Germans see that they're going to spend that 10 months of what's known as the phony war training um, and looking at and trying to address. As opposed to the British and French, you think, we have our doctrine, we're pretty good, we're going to train, but we're going to spend a lot of our time worrying on our, about our plan. Notice, uh, and, I, and I should have mentioned, one of the key moments is 1936, March 1936, when Hitler marches back into the Rhineland. The Rhineland has been demilitarized since the end of the um, First World War. And Hitler says, this is Germany, I'm marching in and putting troops in there, and France and Great Britain do nothing. By their lack of acting, um, it convinces the new King Leopold in Belgium that we can't trust France and Britain to be our saviors. And so what Belgium is going to do is declare themselves neutral. Now, World War I, the Netherlands were neutral. The Germans didn't go there. They didn't go to Switzerland. Makes perfect sense, right? Except that's the only way Germany can get at France because of the Maginot Line. What it does mean, though, is that for France and Belgium, there is no defensive planning. There is no talking um, and uh, no preparations. Um, up until the day the Germans invade in May of 1940, Belgium is neutral. So for the French, they're going to have to do a race. As soon as the Germans cross into Belgium and the Belgians invite them in, the French and the British are going to have to race forward, <coughs> sweeping like a big door up into what's known as the Dial River line along the Dial River. If they're lucky and if they can get up there quick enough, they actually want to extend that line up to Breda uh, in the Netherlands so that they have a continuous front uh, with any Dutch forces up there. They have to do about 100 miles, the Germans have to do 100 miles, so they have to get there quick. So what the French are going to do is put the majority of their motorized and mechanized forces up in the north to do that swing uh, into Belgium. You also notice the green uh, arrows there. That is the Belgian army and their defense planning. They are going to collapse on what their central portion of the country, which has the majority of their population, majority of their industry. They aren't going to stay good defending the Ardennes. If you've been through the Ardennes, it's trees, it's shale. They have a really nice uh, smoked ham. That's about it. Um, so the Belgian plan is to move out of the Ardennes and move back into the central part. The problem is, it means there's no one in the Ardennes. The French aren't there. They're going to have to move into it. The Belgians aren't there. Um, and it basically leaves all that area open to the Germans. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the force comparisons. Um, it's not as unbalanced as you think. About equal in the number of divisions, we'll talk about those uh, in a few moments. But if you look at the British Expeditionary Force, the British Army is all mechanized. And actually, I should have motorized in there. Much of their transportation is trucks and, and rubber wheels. 
Um, but they're the first army in the world to go 100% internal combustion engine and get rid of the horse. Uh, the, the Netherlands will bring 10, the Belgians will bring 22. But when you look at tanks, the Allies outnumber the Germans almost two to one. And if you notice the Germans, 1,500 of those are obsolete, what they call Panzer I's and Panzer II's, armed with either machine guns or a light cannon in the machine gun, very thinly armed. Um, the artillery, particularly because of the French with their methodical battle, a huge advantage. Two to one, 14,000 tubes of artillery. It's in fighters and bombers in particular uh, that the Germans have an advantage, not just in numbers, but also in, um, in just the quality of the aircraft. Think about the Luftwaffe, who starts from zero in 1935. Um, so all their aircraft is relatively modern, new types. They aren't taking aircraft that have been designed 20 years uh, ago. Um, the bottom one is the, uh, the Messerschmitt 109, um, uh, one of the finest fighters uh, at the time. And of course, the Stuka dive bomber, the Ju-87, who has the Jericho trumpets uh, on um, their, their fixed landing gear uh, designed to cause panic. Just so you know what that sounds like. <laughs> Loud and scary. And again and again, uh, seeing those come. But let's take a look at the Germans in a little bit more detail. Because while those numbers, 157, look good, when you actually look at it, the German army has been compared to a spear uh, with a steel, a steel head and a long wooden pole. And in that steel, sha uh, steel head, you have the 10 Panzer divisions. They're absolute elite uh, forces. Six motorized divisions, infantry being moved around primarily by trucks. Um, and then you have the wooden shaft, which are infantry, 61 divisions that are fully capable of doing offense and defensive operations. And then you've got another 30 divisions that are conditionally able to do offense and defense. Then you got 28 divisions that are only good for the defense, and you got some that are only conditionally good for the defense. All those divisions, other than the 16 motorized and mechanized, march on foot. They move at the speed of soldiers' boots, just the way the Roman legions moved 2,000 years ago. And this is going to be a huge piece of the problem for the Germans as they advance through France, because that armored spearhead is going to move quickly, sometimes 30 and 40 miles a day, well, the infantry are likely to do 15 to 20 miles a day, uh, day after day. That picture down there in the bottom showing the motorization, you can see the, um, the German uh, sidecars, motorcycles, but you also see horses that are pulling most of the artillery, much of the, uh, their logistics, uh, logistics carts. For the Allies, the French have three armored divisions, and these are known as Division Crossier, going back to the heavy cavalry. Almost no infantry. These are meant to be that shock effect, smash uh, something. One division, the 4th Armored Division, actually begins its forming on uh, the 10th of May uh, when the Germans uh, attack. They also have six more, uh, motorized divisions, and then these six DLMs, these light mechanized divisions, uh, which are pretty much the equivalent of a Panzer division. Um, they are good balance, about 174 tanks with mechanized infantry and half tracks. Um, the British armored and, uh, and motorized uh, forces uh, for the British Expeditionary Force. So let's talk a little bit about how the German plan changes over time. <coughs> the Germans get done in, in uh, Poland, and Hitler says, we're going to now attack France. And the German army says, what? We really don't want to. And they are going to drag their heels, talking about all the training they have to do, talking about how bad the weather is. The first plan that comes out, and the term that the Germans use for this is Fallgelb, or Case Yellow, uh, for the invasion of France, the first phase of it. And the first one that comes out in October of 1939 pretty much looks like the Schlieffen plan all over again. Three advances, they meet up around Brussels, form a big sweep, and they sweep into France and try to win the war in one big uh, fell swoop again. Um, by the 29th of October, you see that this is starting to move a little bit farther south in, the, in a balance. And this is where, again, chance starts to play a real uh, factor in this campaign. Much of this influence is because of the chief of staff of Army Group A. The German Army Group B is in the north, and they are the main effort, the Schwerpunkt. And Army Group B is in the south, and their chief of staff is a guy named Manstein. 
And Manstein doesn't like being the second fiddle. He doesn't like being the supporting effort. And so he is constantly coming up with plans saying, this isn't going to work. This is just going to replete the sheathing plan of World War I. We need to move more of the forces to the south and give it to Army Group A, the Army Group I'm in, that we're going to be able to go and do it. He consistently is bombarding uh, the, Army, uh, the OKW, the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, the German Army headquarters, with these, and they're getting pretty tired of him. By January, they have moved forces south, and you can see now that you have two big, broad um, advances, one from Army Group B in the north, and then Army Group A in the south, that is now starting to go through the Ardennes. Manstein is continuing to say, this isn't going to work, this isn't going to work, this isn't going to work. Um, and luckily for the Germans, uh, luckily for France, again, fate happens. Two air, uh, they are having a big war game up at Cologne um, in, uh, in uh, uh, Germany. And uh, what they're going to end up uh, doing is a German major uh, with the Luftwaffe is going to fly up there with his buddy in a little Storch two-seat uh, aircraft. He's not supposed to fly up there, uh, but the weather's bad. He decides to fly. His buddy gets lost and crash lands in Belgium, neutral Belgium. Um, and this major at this point knows I'm in serious trouble. So he takes his the plans, which have the entire plans of the Germans um, in January 1940. He goes off behind a, a, a hedge to start destroying these plans. His buddy stays with the aircraft. A Belgian patrol comes along. And he says, and uh, he says, no, it was just me all by myself with the airplane. Uh, but the Belgians notice some fire, uh, smoke coming up behind the hedge. <laughs> yeah. It gets worse. I should have started off with the German major goes behind the hedge to start the fire, and his lighter doesn't work. A Belgian, a Belgian farmer comes along and says, oh, you're trying to start a fire? I've got some matches here. <laughs> he starts the fire. The Belgian patrol sees it. They grab these two officers. Remember, they're not at war now. These are just neutrals that have crash landed. But they seize um, the plans. Uh, and then they're going to do is take them back to their patrol post. And the lieutenant in charge of this patrol is going to call up saying, what do you want me to do with these two majors? And they leave the majors alone for a minute. There's a big potbelly stove in the um, room. It's January. It's burning away. They grab their papers, run over to the potbelly stove, open the door, and throw the maps into the, the, uh, the stove. The Belgians run over there. They grab what they can. They put it out as much as, as they can. But the majors, the German majors say, oh, don't worry about it. We destroyed the plans. Nothing to worry about. Unfortunately, the German intelligence starts picking up huge amounts of radio and telephone traffic uh, in the Belgians. And they realize that they got enough of the plan and that the, the Belgians and, and British and the French now know exactly where uh, we plan to attack. And so the plan's compromised. And just to remind you, here's what the French and uh, Belgian and uh, British plan looks like. And if you notice, as these two plans come together, this is almost perfect. For any of these options, this is where they think the main battle's going to take place. And this is where the French and British have put their best forces. And so the fight will take place there. It actually makes the French even more bold. They say, ah, we know where the Germans are going to come, so we're not just going to go to the Dial River. We're going to go all the way up to Breda, even farther, and be more offensively minded. The Germans, on the other hand, say, our plan is absolutely compromised. What are we going to do? Van Menstein has been constantly bombarding their headquarters uh, with these ideas. Um, they finally have gotten tired of him, and he will be promoted up and out of the Western Front. He's given a corps command in Poland. He's given his third star. And as he moves across Germany to take up his command in Poland, Hitler decides he's going to have a reception for all these brand new promoted lieutenant generals. Hitler's heard about Manstein's plan and wants to talk to him, but he doesn't want to interfere with the army. And so he can't just call Manstein to Berlin. And so he has this reception. As soon as Manstein walks in the room, he says, tell me about your plan. <laughs> um, and here's the plan. It is now making the main effort down to Army Group A uh, with seven out of the 10 Panzer divisions, sweeping through the Ardennes, sweeping just past the left flank of uh, the Maginot Line. And then instead of trying to win the war in one big campaign like they did in World War I, to just go to the Channel Coast, 
to isolate and destroy the French and British forces uh, up here. It's taking all the good British and French divisions, the elite divisions, out of it, and then they'll do a, a, a phase two. Just to remind you, here's how the two of them look when you put the two together. And you can kind of see how lucky those, the Germans are that their majors crashed, um, and how much that the French thought that that plan was not going to change after they got uh, a copy of the plan. So they have laid most of their mechanized motorized divisions are up with 7th Army and the British Expeditionary Force and the 1st Army. These are the absolute best of the Allied forces uh, that are going to be there. As you go down, then when you start getting to 3rd Army and 2nd Army, you start getting good armies because what their fear is is that the Germans if they do penetrate, will come around the flank of the Maginot Line. We put all this money into the Maginot Line. It's only good if you attack us straight on. If you come around the flank, that's the problem. And so you start seeing good forces back with the second, uh, the third uh, army in particular. The second fear the French have is going to be that you, the Germans go directly to Paris. If you go and try to take Paris, then the country itself is going to fall. And the third and least likely, and in their minds, least dangerous, is if they turn to the Channel Coast, because we have lots of time, we can counterattack, and we can uh, and do something about it. And that kind of shows you a little bit of just how well this plan works, because it kind of hits exactly what the French are fearing the most, and getting them already trying to react to the wrong thing. So I want to talk a little bit about Sedan, and, uh, and, and go look at a little bit of the fight at the Sedan. 19th Panzer Corps uh, under Heinz Guderian, made up of three Panzer divisions, the 1st, 2nd, and 10th. Um, absolute elite of the German Army. The 1st Panzer Division, obviously, is the first one raised. This is kind of the model division uh, of the German Army. And the Gross Deutschland Infantry Regiment um, is a regiment made up of volunteers from throughout all of Germany. It's the Greater Germany. And again, this is an elite regiment uh, of infantry also. Facing them is the 147th Fortress Infantry Regiment and 103 bunkers. Fortress infantry units are designed to be in fortresses. They can't move out and around, which is okay. You can put your less um, healthy, maybe your people who aren't in best of shape, because they're going to be sitting in their bunkers at all, all times. But you can bypass bunkers. So between those bunkers, they're going to have what they call uh, interval troops. And in the, uh, the, um, the sector of Sedan, the interval troops are going to be made up of the 71st and 55th Infantry Division. Both of these divisions are what they call B-type uh, reserve divisions. B-type reservists have 20% of their, for, of their uh, fill during peacetime. When war comes, they get the other 80% from reservists that are called back to the colors. The reservists for these reserve divisions in particular are reservists who had served on active duty uh, in the period 1922-1924. Um, so they're all over 40. Um, the rest of the Army calls them the crocodiles uh, because of their wrinkled skin. Uh, and ha ha this is probably some of the worst divisions in the French Army facing up against the absolute best divisions. Here's Sedan. You can see the uh, Meuse River, which flows. Uh, from here, downstream, uh, off to the left. Uh, there's high ground here, what they call the Bois de Marfay. Um, and you can see the French have put a considerable amount of engineering effort into making this a very, very tough uh, place to cross. Uh, I know it's a little busy right now, so let me take off the background <laughs> and just show you what that looks like. And you start to see this is not an undefended piece of ground. Um, none of the bridges over the Meuse River will be left up. Every single one will be burned up. And there's chairs over here. Yes. Anyway, um, but what you should notice from this, all these bunkers with machine guns, heavy machine guns, uh, some of them with cannons, you start noticing the second line down here, which are open rectangles. Those are the positions that have not been completed or started yet. Uh, many of those are planned. And so while you get along the river and on the main line of resistance, um, these bunkers that have been done, the ones, the second line uh, of troops have not been finished. What it means is in uh, Sedan area, it's a very brittle, 
defense. If you get through that first line, you pretty much can continue to penetrate through relatively easily. Here's the Meuse River. Uh, this was in December of 2002. You can see some of these concrete bunkers still there. If you go to Sedan area, um, get the book. Glitz Creek Legend has a wonderful map that has absolutely has the number of every bunker. So you can actually go to the bunker and know exactly which one you're at. But those are machine gun bu uh, bunkers and where the second Panzer Division is going to cross. And here's what the machine gun uh, fields of fire look like. It is absolutely well sighted uh, and has interlocking fields of fire all across the Meuse River. Um, these are well done uh, uh, bunkers. So let's talk quickly about the approach march through the Yadan Ardennes. Uh, we can talk a little bit about some of the problems that the, um, the uh, 19th Panzer Corps will have uh, at places like Bodange um, in uh, Bologna, uh, Bologna in, uh, in Belgium. But it takes them about 58 hours to get through the Ardennes which is okay because the, the French have done war games and they think it takes 60 hours to get through the Ardennes. The problem is the French do what's known as mirror imaging. They give the Germans the same capabilities that they have. The French will then build up huge amounts of artillery, huge amounts of, of, uh, of ammunition, and that would take about seven more days. So even though the Germans get to the Meuse River in two days, it'll take them to day nine before they're ready to assault. The problem is, of course, the Germans don't plan on using heavy amounts of artillery fire. They plan on using those Stuka dive bombers uh, that we showed before as their mobile um, fire. Despite that, the 19th Panzer Corps starts uh, at 3 o'clock. Starting at noontime, the Stukas start to come in and attack. Um, they come in in flights of 40 aircraft. The first flight is at 5,000 feet. The next one's at 12,000 feet. There's a third group that's circling around just waiting for any moving targets and they just continue to peel off and bombard uh, these particular fortifications. The fortifications themselves take very little damage. If you go there today and look at these, uh, some of the big uh, bunkers, you might see a scab where a 250 pound bomb hit it. And it's about a quarter inch scab of, of concrete that's lifted off. Um, what it does do though, is all the interval troops that are in foxholes out behind and around uh, those bunkers, or the artillery that can't be in bunkers because of their firing positions. It hits them very, very hev heavily, and you heard what these Stuka dive bombers for three hours would sound like as they prepped the battlefield. But they start crossing at three o'clock, and the French absolutely stop them dead out of four out of the six crossing points. No one from 2nd Panzer gets crossed. Uh, almost no one from the main assaults in 10th Panzer gets crossed. And only in the 1st Panzer Division area in the Gross Deutschland Regiment are there going to be any successes? And part of the reason those successes, again, goes to this seasoning initiative, lower level leadership. One is a staff sergeant, Rubarth, and he has seven engineers who are going to get across in a rubber boat with explosion, uh, explosives, and they're going to start just blowing up bunkers. They go the wrong way. They're supposed to be blowing up bunkers here to help their division, the 10th Panzer Cross. But Rubarth's being shot at. Those are the ones he starts going for. And what ends up happening is Rubarth and his men, and he has to continue to send men back, get more explosives. Most of his men get killed and wounded. Uh, he gets more guys. They end up taking out many of these positions that allows the 1st Infantry Regiment of the 1st Panzer Division to cross. 1st Panzer is going to get across, and they're going to get to their objectives by about 8.30 at night. Um, they're led by Lieutenant Colonel Homer Balk. Uh, who's an exceptional leader. He'll be an Army Group Commander by 1944. Uh, but Balk gets there. His men are tired. His men have taken heavy losses. He looks up from his positions and knows that this area, the Bois de Marfay, is the key ground. It's 2nd Panzer Division's objectives. But he says, we got to take those objectives. We can't just sit here because he knows 2nd Panzer Division does not cross the river. And he'll leave his troops up there. And by 1130 at night, they start occupying positions up on top of the Bois de Marfay. Why is this important? Well, again, the French are just reacting just a little too slow. They know um, that there has been a pinprick, some limited uh, crossing is the Meuse River. They start sending reinforcements there. The reinforcements start showing up about 12, 1230 at night. They drive into what they think are going to be the secondary positions and help thicken the line. And as they start to drive up here on the Bois de Marfay, they find Germans. And it absolutely starts a, 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 a desperate firefight. 
they're going to fall back. And of course, the reports go up immediately. The Germans are a lot farther along and a lot deeper uh, than we ever imagined uh, that they're going to be. By the 15th, um, and some historians say this is the day the Battle of France is lost. Here's the situation on the morning of the 15th. The Germans have crossed on the 13th. They spend the 14th consolidating their bridgeheads. And there's three small bridgeheads, one at, St at Sedan, one up here at Montreuil, and then uh, Rommel uh, up at Dinant. And um, they're separated about, about 60 miles. And French reserves are starting to move up. But the French reserves are moving up to this area called the Gembleau Gap. And everything that the Allies are looking at is up in Gembleau because that's where they expect the main battle to take place. And if you look at the New York Times here, French meet Nazis in clash of 1,500 tanks. It's a huge armor battle. Two German Panzer divisions versus two French DLMs, uh, Division Light and Mechanical, under General René Prudeau's uh, Cavalry Corps. And the French, when they're fighting the battle they want to with their first line troops, stop the Germans. The Germans are unable to penetrate. Perot's Cavalry Corps is meant to cover the advance of First Army so First Army can get up to their uh, positions, and they do that. Um, and if you look at the losses, Fourth Panzer loses almost half their tanks. But here's the problem. For, uh, Fourth Panzer, Third Panzer are advancing, the French are retreating. If you lose a tank because it ran out of fuel or the track broke or you have some kind of mechanical problem and you're French, you destroy the tank and continue retreating so the Germans can't get it. If you're the German and your tank runs out of fuel or throws a track, you stay there and you fix your tank. So while they destroy 40 to 45 percent of the tanks on the 14th and 15th, many of those tanks the next week or so will come back uh, into the fight. So there's only about 40 tanks that are permanently destroyed um, out of this fight. But this is on the 14th and 15th, while that crisis is taking place at Sedan, this is where the Allied main efforts is focused. This is where their air effort is focused. And it's only going to be late in the afternoon on the 15th where they suddenly realize how bad this crisis. Gamelin, who's been sitting in Paris, has allowed uh, the army commander in this front to pretty much control the battle. He has not been playing an active role. And what ends up happening is both the 9th Army and the 2nd Army look at what they consider the most dangerous. 2nd Army, it's the Germans are going to come around here and come around Verdun and come around the Imaginal Line. So 2nd Army pulls back this way. 9th Army, the same thing. They're worried about their flank, and they pull back the other way. And basically what ends up happening is you have a gate open for the Germans uh, by the night of the 15th. Uh, because no senior commander is consolidating and coordinating the battle, the German commanders at their level, or excuse me, the British, French commanders at that level are reacting on their own. When you look at 7th Panzer Division, for example, uh, and you look at um, Rommel's advance, that advance is 75 miles deep. It's one mile wide. 75 miles deep, one mile wide. This is the opportunity they had to smack them and counterattack. But what ends up happening is the French are just a little too slow. They're a little bit too behind. The start positions they, they give for their troops to actually start the counterattack, by the time the troops get there to occupy them, are already in German hands. The first and second uh, divisions, uh, the, the armored divisions uh, of the French, they send their big, heavy Charby tanks by rail. And then they use the roads for their fuel trucks and maintenance uh, elements. The tanks by rail get ahead, the other ones are moving on the road, and right between the two columns, it goes the Germans. Uh. So now you have all the tanks in the north with no fuel, no maintenance, and it's, again, it's just all this little, just falling behind, falling behind uh, timeline. Uh, there's going to be fight in the stone. We're running a little out of time, so I won't go into detail. We can talk about um, Captain Villon and Ure, the uh, French Char B. It's going to do what the Germans call the Amok Fart, this crazy run. It goes into the town of Stone, pushes out the Grossdeutschland Regiment, destroys 13 German tanks lined up on the road, comes down, destroys an anti-tank gun, turns the hairpin curve, goes down to the bottom, destroys another anti-tank gun, turns around, Cap Billo opens his hatch to look at everyone following him, and he's all alone. And he then turns around and has to go back up um, the hill. When he goes back to his French starting positions, there's 140 holes in his tank 
that have not penetrated. Um, the incredible amount of uh, damage uh, these Char B tanks are able to uh, uh, take. The town of Stone, in a two-day period, will change hands 17 times. All right, and that just shows, and part of this is fighting is the 3rd Armored Division of France um, and the 3rd North African Division, elite units, first-line units, against the Gross Deutschland and the 10th Panzer. German tanks continue to move out. There will be a slight counterattack at Ara on the t uh, 24th of May. And again, it's just a little too late, a little too slow. Um, the counterattack is supposed to be four divisions, two French, two British. The French divisions don't go because we're really busy. We can't have a hard time getting to the start point. So Lord Galt, uh, Gort with the uh, British Expeditionary Force um, creates what's known as Frank Force for the uh, commander, um, Franklin. Uh, it's supposed to be 15,000 men, two divisions, 74 tanks. But again, what ends up happening? It isn't two divisions. It's two battalions, 2,000 men. Um, they attack, and they make a surprisingly good impression. Uh, will cause some panic in the 7th pa uh, Panzer Division with Rommel. It will have one uh, major effect, is that it shows Hitler and Rundstedt, the, the commander of, uh, of the Western Front, that the southern flank is not secure uh, of this big panzer corridor, and Hitler will order what, what's known as the halt order. The halt order stops the panzers so that the Luftwaffe can do the destruction of the uh, Northern Army Group. It allows that breathing room for the miracle of Dunkirk. And you can see between the, uh, the, the halt order and 24th, you start seeing that line continues to get smaller and smaller until it's back around the uh, French port of Dunkirk. 26th to the 2nd of June, um, they evacuated over 330,000 men from the pocket, almost all the uh, British Expeditionary Force with none of their equipment. 121,000 French and Belgians who will then transport, go across Britain, back on boats, come back to Cherbourg, be handed new rifles, and uh, go into the fight all over again. Um, 700 ships, Royal Navy ships, and small boats will take place, and they're going to lose almost 290 of those. So this is not a, you know, this is, when you say a miracle, it's a hard-fought-off uh, miracle. And I should mention, Operation Dynamo is not the only uh, withdrawal by sea that they're going to do. When the French surrender at the end of June, there will be a second called Op Operation Ariel from the Channel Ports. Uh, Le Havre and, uh, and Cherbourg, it'll bring off another 121,000 uh, soldiers. Um, Case Red, Fall uh, Rot is the German follow-up on the uh, 5th of June. The French with this crisis in late May have brought in Marshal Platon, the hero of Verdun, as the uh, vice, chief, or vice prime minister. He's 84 years old. He's brought in because he's the hero of Verdun not because he's expected to do anything other than it's Patan. It also brings in Maxime uh, uh, Vagan, who is, was the chief of staff under Foch, and he is brought in, he's 74 years old, he's, or 73 years old, he's replacing a 68-year-old. Uh, and he's brought on because of that, 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 um, that connection to the victory in Foch. Um, and Vagan is going to come up with a plan uh, that basically creates a hedgehog checkerboard pattern of defenses all throughout um, uh, this area. Basically, any little town is, uh, is, is turned into a fortified area. Uh, the French are 360-degree are uh, security, so they can be bypassed. And they are supposed to fight until uh, they are overwhelmed. In between these towns and fortified areas, uh, the French mechanized divisions are supposed to be uh, there to counterattack. The problem is, is you've lost 24 infantry divisions, one armored division, um, two out of the five cavalry divisions and uh, six out of the seven mechanized divisions up in that northern pocket. Where the French start the war with 104 divisions, they have about 50, uh, 43 divisions for this second phase. Um, the French army fights very, very well um, starting on the 5th of June. The Germans are held up for almost three entire days before they're able to push through um, because the, the French have no reserves. They have everything there in the line, and once you wear that down, um, they're going to uh, they're going to break out, and it starts the foot race all over uh, France. I shouldn't say foot race; it's an it's internal combustion engine race. The French are just on foot. Paris is going to um, uh, their French government will move out on the 10th of uh, June. 
Uh, by the 17th, um, Patan will become uh, prime minister and he will start talking about an armistice. Um, the armistice uh, will be signed to come again, the same place, the same park that the German surrender takes place in 1918. The Germans go and get the railway car, which is in a museum. They bring it out to the spot. <laughs> Hitler gets on there. They have the opening um, portion of the ceremonies. He then leaves. Um, they then do the um, surrender. There is no negotiations. It's here's your, here's your, uh, your, your surrender. Um, they then take the railway car to Berlin, where it's going to be destroyed by the Royal Air Force later in the war. And then they raise the park at Compiègne that had been there to the victory uh, of 1918. The only thing they leave is a statue to Marshal Foch that they don't take down. Um, the Maginot Line, 52 major fortresses in the Maginot Line, none fall to the Germans. There'll be some, about 10 minor fortresses that'll fall, but the Maginot Line worked exactly the way it was supposed to. It made the Germans come somewhere else. Um, the, Ger the British lose 85,000 killed, wounded, and their country is, of course, divided up into free and then occupied um, France. The British lose all their equipment, all their tanks, all their trucks. The only thing they do have is trained manpower. Uh, Lord Gort with the British Expeditionary Force withdrawing them uh, at Dunkirk probably saves Britain, <laughs> saves, saves the West. Uh, and then the Germans, it's not a cakewalk. 156,000 casualties in a six-week campaign. So let's talk a little bit about the reality of the campaign. It really had comes down to training. It's the junior varsity, the worst divisions in the French army against the absolute elite uh, of the German army. Um, this idea of methodical battle, of trying to get all this perfect intelligence and being able to synchronize your fires, just doesn't work when your opponent is trying exactly the opposite of moving quickly and rapidly and going as deeply as possible. Um, the campaign plan, you take away all their motorized and mechanized divisions. You really don't have much else you can do after that. Um, and the last thing, of course, is impenetrable Ardennes, hardly. That particular picture is taken from a monument outside of Sedan. Um, it's a monument to the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One at Fort Riley. Um, it's from 1918. It's when the U.S. Army moved through the Ardennes. We know you can go through the Ardennes. The French know. The Germans know. Um, you have to do something to stop uh, uh, people from going through it. That's the Char B. Uh, that's actually at Stone. That's not your A, but it's a, a similar one. Um, thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs>that was fantastic mark um, all I ask is that uh, because we don't have too many people here um, we don't have microphones so please repeat the question and okay. we'll do about five then we'll be done okay good yes sir uh, you only m mentioned slightly the role of the Air Force in this <coughs> and only I, I grant you're mm -hmm. concentrating on the tanks mm -hmm. but the commitment of the Royal Air Force to the French mm -hmm. Yeah. Come across any of that? Uh, the, the, the question's about the role of air power altogether. And, you know, part of it is because of France um, and because of Norway also, which had been invaded in April, the fear is that there's going to be the sneak attack. And so much of the Allied air power, even some of the best squadrons of France, are stationed in North Africa because they expect they're going to have plenty of time to move them from North Africa back up there, which is going to hamper their, their, their peace in this. Um, the Royal Air Force is going to play uh, a huge role, and as is the, uh, the French Air Force. Uh, and the problem is just that the Germans have got the ability, experience from uh, the Condor Legion in Spain, of moving airfields quickly, staying up behind the front. Um, Doughty is going to say we need 52 squadrons um, to, um, to defend uh, Britain. And it's not that Churchill gets it backwards. He has already gotten down to 36 squadrons left in uh, Great Britain because Churchill keeps going to Paris 
and saying, here, what do you need, what do you need, what do you need? And uh, the French continue to say, we need air power, we need air power, we need air power. Um, so, and, and part of it is just the, Germ the, the German aircraft are all relatively new. French, British aircraft, they have uh, British battles. Um, this terrible aircraft flies low range. Um, entire squadrons will go in. There's one day where they're attacking the Meuse River uh, bridgeheads. They attack with 71 aircraft, 40 of them get shot down. It is the heaviest casualties of any comparable raid um, for the RAF in its history. Um, and, and so the disparity just gets worse and worse and worse. Ironically, when you get towards Dunkirk, now you start to have the Royal Air Force flying from airfields in Kent who can start staying over the battlefield, and it starts to level it off uh, a little bit um, at that time period. Um, but it, the fight about when is too much, when do you not support France anymore, is a huge contentious issue. Um, the French think that they were stabbed in the back by the, the evacuation of Dunkirk. Um, Gort, for his, um, his piece, the first eight days of the campaign, he gets zero orders from his army commander, the French army commander he works for. The British Expeditionary Force just kind of sits there. They fight, but not really heavy um, peace. The only time they start to really worry about Gort and the BEF is when they want him to counterattack at Ara, and that's where um, Gort's going to play a role. So hopefully that answered it. Uh, question? Yes, sir. Well, yeah, the problem is, and part of it is when you, oh, the, uh, the thank you, Mike, <laughs> repeating the question. Um, the question is about um, the, the Germans are going to look at um, other people like uh, JFC Fuller. Uh, Guderian actually hires a, um, a translator who takes uh, British newspaper reports of, of mechanized experiments, translates it into German. And the question is whether the French did something similar. Um, yes, I mean, there's talk, there's looking at what's going on in Spain. Um, uh, as uh, 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 the Civil War is going on. Part of the problem is, as you start getting into this, 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 this fight of the Third Republic, um, de Gaulle, for example, is going to write a book called Towards a Professional Army. Um, and it really says we don't need this huge, expansive conscript army. We need a small professional force that are motorized and mechanized. And when you look at that, he tries to publish it in 35, 36 right at the time when Leo Bloom and the Popular uh, Front um, have been elected, this leftist government, they look at it not as a means of making the army better, but as a means of making the army more reactionary and fascist. And so when you start talking about you know, improving the army, a lot of it gets wrapped up in internal politics and not necessarily any kind of logical uh, piece. So yeah, they, they do do quite a bit. Part of it is when the French use history, um, in the interwar period, they want to go and prove what they think is right. So they think firepower is what is going to be good, so they go back and they tell people, go back to the First World War, show me where the use of mass amounts of firepower worked. And so the historians go back and they write all these articles about how great firepower was at Verdun and how it worked in the Veld offenses or how it failed. It's self-supporting. They never go back and say, show me when it doesn't work, because there's just as many examples of when firepower doesn't work as it does, they, they, they reinforce what they already think. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Did any German unit ever attack a major segment of the Maginot Line? Did any unit attack yet, uh, any segment of the Ma uh, Maginot Line? Yes, there's going to be attack um, in the uh, mid part of June uh, on some of the forts, La Ferte, uh, on the Maginot Line. It's not one of the big fortresses, it's part of the outlying ones. Um, but part of it is to make sure that you have newsreel photos of the German army taking Maginot Line <laughs> forts. Um, part of the other thing is Rommel thinks he's gone through the extension of the Maginot Line. I mean, the Maginot Line ends where it ends for two reasons. One is you don't put a wall behind your allies if you expect them to be good allies. The other part is these are the low countries. There's not a big difference between the water tables, so you can't build these huge fortifications up in the, uh, the plains uh, up there in northern France. There are, much like you saw at Sedan, these fortress, these, these pillboxes, but they're more individual fighting positions. And when Rommel breaks through at Dinant, he thinks he's broken through a minor section of the Maginot Right, right his wife Lou, saying, hey, I've broken through the Maginot Line, uh, aren't I wonderful? Uh, but yeah, the Germans will attack La Ferreta to, to show that they can do it.
And they take some huge losses um, uh, as they do it. Yes, sir. Was there anything uh, like a typical Fortress Foundation line? Because my impression was they were just a lot of toolboxes. Oh, no. I, you know, I, the, the question is about was there a, tw a typical Fortress on the Maginot line? And I, I really, I should have put some photos in here of, of the Maginot line fortresses. The Maginot line fortresses are these huge sectors. All you see above ground are pillboxes and disappearing gun turrets. But what you have is interlocking um, uh, tunnels in there. Some of the larger fortresses actually have rail networks. They have little trains that move between them because the distances are so great underground. Barracks, um, command posts, munition bunkers, uh, bakeries, uh, kitchens, all these things built underground. So you have these huge underground cities. The only thing you see is these little pop-up uh, pillboxes. And there is a section of the Maginot Line um, down to the south of Verdun that's been restored that if you ever go over there, you can actually take a look at. But it's a, it's a huge, massive undertaking. One time for one more question. I'm getting the... Yes, sir. Can, can you speak to the legit, the German su supply? <laughs> The question is about the German supply, uh, the, the logistics on this campaign. Um, very, very tenuous with the armored divisions as they move forward. They are using, uh, much of the same way they did when they go down into Austria uh, for the Anschluss, they're using ba basically just gas stations on the road. Uh, they're cap, I mean, <laughs> literally, uh, they're capturing uh, fuel supplies. Um, Rommel at some points is at, absolutely, they're, they're moving fuel forward. Um, the troops are talking about how they have almost no fuel. fuel. They, they, their first halt order is after seven days, and they're exhausted. One of their Panzer Regiment commanders actually just falls down um, from physical exhaustion. But they're moving fuel forward, but they're capturing what they can um, in there as, as much as possible. But it's very tenuous. Uh, it is pretty much luck uh, when they get the halt order. They love it because it allows them to resupply and start fixing tanks. All right. Well, thank you.